Good morning. How are we all this morning? Good. Okay, so I was trying to remember the last time I was here. I think it's been almost a year. And truth be told, that was actually the last time I preached. So if I'm a little rusty, that's why. <laughs> and everyone online, it's good to see you all-ish. Um, I know you can see me, I can't see you, but that's okay. It's actually probably better that way. You all make me nervous. Just, just kidding. Um, so a little bit about myself. There are some people that probably don't know me um, that have not been here since I was here. My name is Rachel Reining, and I live in Cadillac, Michigan, which is about an hour and 40 minutes north of here. Um, I am married to Gavin Reinink. We've been married for 14 years. We have three children. Madeline just turned 13 on Friday, and I cried all day because I have a teenager now, and I'm like, I cannot be that old. <sighs> She's a cool girl, though. She really is. She's just, like, you know you have kids, and you're like, are they going to be okay? And I think she's going to be okay. I think she is. Uh, Emily is 11, also a cool girl. She's super artistic. She's always painting and drawing and, like, you know, she's like one with nature. She's always walking around and, and seeing the little things. And I just love that. You know, like, she makes us slow down and appreciate things. And I just, she's going to be okay too, I think. And then Brady is in second grade, and he brings everything to life. Um, he loves to dress up, be in character, um, and he puts perspective on things that I would have never put perspective on. And I think that's pretty neat. So, yeah, that's a little bit about us. We actually moved to Cadillac um, just a little over a year ago. We actually lived in the Granville area for about 16 years, but we we're from McBain. Um, my husband and I were born and raised there, and we moved to the Grand Rapids area when my husband went to college. And so, yeah, we just had established our life, and then last year we felt the call to move back home. So we did, and so that's kind of why we're there now. And um, I was pastoring a church and left the church and have just been working part-time and um, being a mom and trying to figure life out slowly but surely, which I'll talk about in a little bit here. But So that's just, in a nutshell, a little bit about me this morning. And I'm just really grateful to be here. And I just want you to know... Um, that I really, really appreciate y'all. Um, it's been a tough year. Actually, it's been a, a tough couple years for the church at large. Um, pastors as a whole have gone through a lot. I can't speak for other um, professions, uh, but I'm sure I've watched other professions struggle immensely, but um, as a pastor, um, I had to step away because it was too much. It was just too much for me, um, just to be completely honest with you. Um, and Pastor Mike knew that. And uh, every once in a while he'd say, are you ready yet? And I'd say, nope, <laughs> not yet. And then he asked me a couple weeks ago, are you ready yet? And I said, I think I can. I think I'm ready to come back. And you are the first place that I feel comfortable enough to come back to. So thank you for being comfortable enough. I appreciate that so much. So anyway, all that to say, um, I'm going to talk about radical welcome today. I'm not that good at it, uh, but I'm just going to talk about it. What's in a name? I was thinking about that since Pastor Mike texted me. What's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. In the famous play, Juliet is trying to argue that it doesn't matter that Romeo's last name is Montague and hers is Capulet, right? Um, she's trying to make the point that it isn't the name that matters, but what's inside that counts. It seems like a lovely way to view the world. It seems honorable, doesn't it? 
It, tr- it truly does. I mean, it's, it's just what's inside that counts, right? And ironically, this quote actually hits really close to home for me because my maiden name is Rose, and I married a man and took his last name. So uh, I have another name. <laughs> anyway, when I was thinking about radical welcome these past few weeks, um, I was thinking about how that relates to names. And naturally, it sent me on this long tangent, which I'm inviting you on today. So last weekend, my husband and I celebrated our 14th wedding anniversary. And for my gift, my husband wrote down um, several memories from over the length of our relationship together. And one of the last things he wrote down was this. One year ago, we left a place we know to move to a place we thought we knew. We left a place we know, meaning Granville, to move to a place we thought we knew, meaning the McBain area. When I read that sentence, it stopped me in my tracks and the lump formed in my throat. And goodness knows the tears just streamed on my face. Because quite honestly, I couldn't have said it better myself. He wasn't implying that we don't love where we live, because we do. We absolutely love where we live. He wasn't implying that we made a mistake, because we did not. We made the right decision to move home. We have never been healthier. I have never been healthier. I had to move home to heal. I had to. What he was implying was that this year was a giant learning curve. And it was an anonymous one. I realized this when I would go into stores or to restaurants. No one knew or remembered my name. Apparently, I don't look like 17-year-old Rachel anymore. (laughs) Go figure. But nor did people ask. But lots of people stare. I don't look like a Dutch girl. I honestly don't think they're trying to be rude. I think they're genuinely just trying to figure out if I'm from these parts or not. Which is funny because all they'd have to do is ask. It is a small town after all. (laughs) And yet people rarely do. I sometimes felt like a foreigner. I felt unseen. I felt nameless at times. And if I'm honest, that's a bit uncomfortable. There are days when I wanted so desperately for someone to just introduce themselves to me, to ask me about my life, to make me feel like I belonged. But it wasn't that simple. It took time. It took more energy on our part to show up consistently. We had to be intentional about engaging with people, even though we were the new ones. We had to show up to every single event, every single week, so everyone knew that we belonged. And sometimes it was so emotionally exhausting, you guys. After a day of pouring all the energy out, I would go home and I'd put on my running shoes and I would sweat out the anxiety that would have been pent up from putting myself out there. I don't know if you deal with anxiety, but I do. And I think I've talked about that before. And as I consider this past year, it has me asking this question, does a rose by any other name matter when we consider this idea of a radical welcome? In other words, do names matter? And to get at the answer, we're going to go back to the beginning of the portion of scripture in Genesis. And there are probably a lot of different ways to get about finding the answer, but this week we're going to look at Genesis chapter 16. So if you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 16. And this story is super awkward, so here we go. Quite frankly, I don't really want to share it, 
But every time I'd say, God, I think I have a different story, God would say, too bad. (laughs) I really didn't want to do this story. I even thought about breaking my own rules and just like cherry picking a verse out of the whole story. Um, But the truth is I couldn't do that. Because if we consider radical welcome, we have to consider the raw, extremely uncomfortable, awkward, messy, ridiculous situations that people get themselves into. And this is one of them. So welcome to Sundays with Rachel. Not unlike any other day. Super fun. So Genesis chapter 16, um, we're going to start at verse 7. Um, I assumed that there are probably younger ears in the crowd, so that's why I'm starting at verse 7. Um, if you want to read the entire story, you can start at verse 1. Um, those verse one through six, verses 1 through 6 are definitely for adult ears. Um, that's why I'm skipping that portion, just so you know. Um, starting at verse 7, To give you a little recap, we have a slave. Her name is Hagar. You've probably heard her name before. She is a slave to Abram and Sarai, um, and she was forced to marry Abram simply to become pregnant because Sarai couldn't have babies. And then Sarai gets angry at Hagar for being pregnant. (laughs) What a pickle. So Hagar is like, I. She, she runs away. Verse 7. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road of Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Bir Lahoi Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael. Okay, so I get that there are probably a lot of directions I could go here, but I really want to focus on, as you might have guessed, the names in this story. And then I want to focus on the interactions that take place. First, I want to focus on Hagar. Interestingly, Hagar in Hebrew, which is what this story was originally written in, means one who flees or a foreigner. is isn't actually a name. So Hagar probably isn't Hagar. Her name is probably more of a title or a label of sorts. Does that bother anyone else besides me? How often do we label people instead of inquiring about who they actually are or where they came from? How often do we do that? How often, I was thinking about this, how often do I just make assumptions about people just by looking at them? All the time. Literally every single day, I make an assumption about someone just by looking at them. Shame on me. 
The next name worth noting is Ishmael. Ishmael, the name God asks Hagar to name her baby in Hebrew, means God hears. I have no doubt that there will be more to the reasoning as to why his name is what it is, but in this particular moment, in this particular space, imagine how Hagar feels. A slave who doesn't have choices to make. No choices about where she goes, what she eats, what she can do with her body. A woman whose body is used for solely one purpose. A person who doesn't even get to use her real name. And God says, I hear you. It's also worth noting that God, disguised as an angel, because note in verse 7 where it says an angel of the Lord, but in verse 13 where she said she gave a name to the Lord who spoke to her, so she knows it was God, not just an angel, also tells Hagar that Ishmael will be a wild donkey of a man. (laughs) I have to laugh. (laughs) Oh, God has a sense of humor. And he will be against everyone, and everyone will be against him. I feel like there's a dichotomy here. God's saying, I I hear you, and then your son's going to be a donkey of a man. I don't understand always. Sometimes when I read biblical text, I have no idea what to do with it. And this happened to be one of those times, and you know what? That's okay. I think sometimes we, o- we overanalyze things and we overcomplicate things. And, and sometimes it's okay to say, I don't know. In this particular moment, I didn't know. I didn't know the answer. And it was, that's not what I was focusing on. And that's for another sermon and for another study and for another day. And maybe... Pastor Mike will say, like, I can take that and flesh it out, but I don't know. I just think that's really interesting that God hears and you're going to have a donkey of a man for a son. And you can just laugh about it and move on. So anyway, back to the story. We have this nameless slave who is Hagar, who's a foreigner. We have a donkey of a man named God Hears. And then Hagar gives God a name. The audacity. The audacity of this woman is is just astounding to me because she is literally the only person in Scripture who renames God. The only person. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about this particular moment this week, and at first I thought to myself, well, that's not that big of a deal. But she calls God El Roy, which means the God who sees me. El Roy, the God who sees me. And when I think about that, it's like, well, duh, of course God sees you, but if you've never been seen... how would you know what that feels like? How would you know that God sees people? How would you know that God is for you until that particular moment? This is the first time for Hagar. And it felt different for her. So contrary to Juliet's thoughts, I have to wonder, do names matter? We have a nameless girl, a boy named God hears, and a God who has been named God sees. This entire story is riddled with details about names, and I think I would argue that names do in fact matter. And here's why. 
If we go back to the very beginning of the interaction in the story, what do we notice? God calls to Hagar. He says, Hagar. He calls her name. And I think in this story, I like to believe that God called her by whatever her true name was. And I don't know if, if her name truly was Hagar or if it truly was something else. But either way, God says her name. Names matter. And then asks two very important questions. Where did you come from? And where are you going? Where did you come from? And where are you going? God already knew the answers to those questions. These questions are important not because of the questions themselves, but because she felt seen. She was being given an opportunity to share about herself. In the depth of that, the depth of that, to be able to share about yourself for her was overwhelming. I think if I were to offer a definition for radical hospitality or radical welcome, I would say that it is allowing someone to feel comfortable enough to share their story. To not make them feel anonymous or just a body or a burden. And I think that we can offer radical hospitality or radical welcome to start by learning people's names. I think we've lost that art. I, I have. I'm terrible with names. I'll be the first to admit it. I walked in here and I went, I don't remember your name. <laughs> I'm, I will be the first to raise my hand. I'm right there with you all. Because there, there's something to it, you know, to have someone know your name to be seen, to be heard, to be asked about yourself, to be able to feel like you can be vulnerable with someone, to be authentic, to be true, to, to be real. We all crave it. So why do we often miss the opportunity? It's, it's a rhetorical question, but one I've been sitting with for the past couple weeks. Why do we miss the opportunities to offer this radical welcome, this radical hospitality for people? Anyway, back to the storyline. I'm not going to lie. Things get weird after God's radical hospitality toward Hagar. As we read earlier, God calls her to go back to Abram and Sarai. Wait a minute. So you just had this beautiful encounter, like you feel seen, you feel valued, like, okay, and I'm going to go off into the desert and ride off in this beautiful sunset and everything's going to be hunky-dory, but no, God says, no, I'm going to need you to go back and submit to the person who's treating you like dirt, and that makes no sense to me. Now, this is a part of scripture where I actually sat and analyzed. You're welcome. I work at a little coffee shop part-time, and I work with some pretty smart people there. And I was kind of hashing this out with them, and one of them said, actually, I've done some work on this, and um, it makes sense. So what if she had stayed in the desert? She is a woman and a slave. What would have happened to her if she'd have stayed there? She has no means, no money, no way to prepare food. She would have died. And so would her baby. So what did God do? If you read on, God said, I need you to go back and submit, but I'm going to multiply your generations. I'm going to do something for you. I know that this season is really difficult, but hang on. Things are going to get better. I see you. 
I hear you. Hang on. It's going to be okay. Sometimes we get really laser focused and we can only see like what's right in front of us. But that's why it's really important for us to have people that welcome us so that we can see beyond. For the past several months, I had worked at Love in the Name of Christ. Um, it was a nonprofit organization. Um, I don't work there now, but I, I had been. And a lot of times, people would call in and ask for things that were so specific. My job was to unpack the unspecific. My job was to say, okay, I know that you're asking for $20 um, to pay this bill, but I understand that there are underlying issues. Let's see the whole picture, right? So our job to have radical welcome is to help people see all of us have a radical welcome, right? Not just a little welcome, all the welcome, the whole kingdom. This is part of who God is. I want you to see who all of God is. Hagar, this is a little bit of who I am. Hang on, sister. Hang on, sister. I know this is tough, but hang on. There's going to be so much more for you. Could it be that God called Hagar back because God knew that there was life to be lived? I don't really have an antidote for the problem I believe society has with not engaging with people. Um, like I said, I'm not very good at it myself. But what I can do is offer three stories um, of examples that have happened in my own life or someone I know's life. And so the first story is from my experience from the coffee shop owner that I now work at. Um, so back in September, I had applied to work at this little coffee shop in McBain. And I had done like all of the due diligence. I wrote out this really fancy resume, you know, printed it on fancy paper, I handed it in, waited like a couple like days, and she finally emailed me back and said, "I'd like to meet you um, to have an interview." And I said, "Great, I you know I'd love to um, work for you. I think your coffee shop is beautiful, and I think I love what you stand for, and um, I I would love that." So I met with her, and I walked in, and she said, "Hi, Rachel. Would you like a cup of coffee?" And I said. Yeah, I would, love, I would love one. So she gets me a cup of coffee, and it was a beautiful day outside. And she goes, do you want to sit outside? I said, I would love to. And we sat outside, and then before she even went into anything about the job, she asked questions about me. She asked me about why I moved back home. She asked me about my family. She asked me um, how I was doing. And then she moved into... What are your gifts? What are your talents? What do you like to do? She made sure I felt seen and valued. And to this day, that's all she does. She makes sure every single employee is seen and valued and every customer that comes in, I mean, she just embodies this idea of radical welcome and I just, I try so hard to figure out how she does it, and I'm not good at it. But I want to be that, you know? It's like, how do you, how? How do you do that? That's one example, and I just, I love it. The second story happened to me a few weeks ago. Um, so when I work at the coffee shop, I don't normally work, like, behind the coffee bar making coffee because you don't really want me to do that. I mean, sometimes I do, and I don't know that they appreciate it. Um, I do mostly behind-the-scenes work for them, um, but sometimes when they're in a giant pickle, then I do. And I was that day, unfortunately, for most people. And there was a drive through line, and there was one of the other baristas, who was an actual barista, she said, who's that 
what's that person's name? And I was like, I don't know. That, it's a young girl, and she's, she's much younger than I am. Like, I wouldn't, I mean, yes, we're from a small town, but if she's much younger than me, I would probably know her parents' names, not her name. And we got, then it was like this whole conversation about people's names, and they're like, well, it's okay. You know, you've only been here for a couple months. You'll get to know everyone's names eventually. And I said, well, I mean, I've been here for like seven months now, and literally no one knows my name. And I just said it like, blat like blatantly, and I shouldn't have, you know, like one of those smart alecky comments, because I tend to do that a lot. Anyway, the school superintendent was standing there, and he looked at me, and I went, ah, hi. <laughs> and um, he said, you're right. I see you here all the time, and I do not know your name. My name is Scott. What is yours? And in that moment, I realized that he realized I needed to be seen. And it was a very beautiful moment. The third story is about communion in a little church up north. This is not my story, but a story that was just told to me this week. Um, it was Easter Sunday, I believe. And the pastor was offering communion um, to the congregation. Now remember, um, this is small town USA, and everyone pretty much knows everyone except me um, and a few other people, but generally most everyone knows everyone. And this particular church, the pastor normally, so like normally communion, the baskets are passed and people take the communion cups there. But this particular Sunday, the pastor invited everyone up to take communion from him. So he held the bread and the cup. And when he did that, everyone fi like sing had a single file. He would say, Christ's body broken for you, Christ's blood poured out for you. And then he would say, each person's name. What a powerful experience to have. To be reminded that Jesus was born and lived and died and rose again specifically for you, Rachel Reining. To have your name said out loud in those moments was a Hagar moment for this girl. To be seen, to be heard, to be valued it was radical. The kingdom was revealed for her. Not just a little bit, but all of it. And I just, I wonder how can we continue that type of welcome here and in our daily, everyday lives? We, we, have, we have such really busy lives, and it's so easy for us to just pass people by and not make the eye contact and to keep our head down and miss the opportunity and I'm, I'm telling you, this year has taught me to not miss the opportunity. People need you to not miss the opportunity. We, we were shut in for two years. So many missed opportunities. And that's like we kind of forgot how to interact with each other, I think. I don't know. I don't, I don't really know, but I just, I think now's the time that we have, we get, we get to start something new, something fresh, something exciting. And I, if, if all, if anybody can do it, it surely is you. It surely is me. It surely is the church, right? Yeah, amen. So what's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet as the line that Juliet says, but I beg to differ. What's in a name? 
a lot. Because a rose by any other name would feel unseen, unheard, unnoticed, and that is not radical welcome, now is it? Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to understand through your love and your hospitality what we ought to do in our own lives So God, I ask that you give us the courage and the space and the opportunities to say people's names. God, we love you. Amen. Um, Do I have benediction now? Yeah. Yeah. I can do it now. So um, would you all stand? I often give the same benediction. It's different than the normal benediction um, simply because I think it's beautiful and genuine and um, it meant a lot to me when I heard it for the first time. So... um, What I would ask is that you open your hands and receive this. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Thank you, Rachel.